The German Chancellor, Otto von Bismarck, said near the end of the 19th century, the decisive element of modern history is the fact that the North Americans speak English. But there are now two Englishes, or one language that we might call English-American or American-English. And the story of the last century is how these two Englishes have grown together, sometimes in harmony, sometimes in competition. America was flexing its economic muscles at that time, and the words and phrases reflect that. Big business, executive, well-heeled, fat cat, go-getter, and yes man, as well as assembly line and clothes shop, they're all American English. Europe had its towers, but it took America to build and to name that quintessential image of the country, the skyscraper. The first skyscraper ever was built here in Chicago in 1885. It's been knocked down. But this one was built soon afterwards. It's now the oldest one still standing in Chicago. No, it's a hotel. Hotel, in the modern sense, is an American word. In French, it just meant a large private house. And it was in America that they first called this reception area a lobby, with its desk clerk, I mean clerk, dressed in black, of course, at the front desk, its bellhop and its concierge, another European word given its modern meaning in America. To get to your penthouse, if you should be so lucky, you would, of course, need an elevator. English already had the rather less technical word, lift, but as Oscar Wilde inevitably said, we have really everything in common with America nowadays, except, of course, language. You can see it everywhere, and a hotel gives us quite a few examples. In England, we would have a wardrobe. This is a closet. In England, we would have a bathroom. Well, that's the same, but it could also be called a washroom. A tub with a faucet, not a bath with a tap. And when we go into the bedroom, well, at least that's the same word, we find that the window has drapes, not curtains. The bed has covers, not bedclothes. Instead of a dressing gown, here's a bathrobe. Beside the bed, there's a nightstand, not a bedside table. And somewhere, there's a trash can, not a waste paper basket. The British had long looked down on the way the Americans used the language. Coleridge thought the word talented was a vile and barbarous American word. But it was, in fact, English. Dickens noted how they corrupted the language with words like reliable and lengthy. There's always been some perhaps misinformed resistance to American words, but the Americans have never cared much for English opinion about their use of the English language. The poet Walt Whitman observed in 1888 that American English was the apotheosis of slang, a glorious new language, he said, reinvented away from the traditions and authority of British English. Hey, Mark, we got a problem. I, I don't have the chicken wings. I ordered them two days ago. Let's go for the wishbone omelet. Wishbone? Yeah. And with the omelet, you also get a corn muffin, a biscuit, or toast. It's, you guys get growth. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. It's awesome. awesome. You get apple, maple, or chicken and dewy. The psychiatrist lived, we should point out that the increase um, will not be any more than the savings. Right. Okay. Well, they're writing over 2,600 and a quarter. All righty. In Britain, correct English was linked with manners, morals, and, of course, class. Just as one had to keep a straight bat and hold one's knife and fork correctly, so one had to use the right words. Use the wrong one, and you could be caught out. Edwardian English abhorred flamboyance. When somebody wrote to Rupert Brooke, the young poet who died during the First World War, that he'd left Cambridge University in a blaze of glory, the poet's mother crossed out that melodramatic phrase and replaced it with a single word. It read, he left Cambridge University in July. In part, it was a case of British formality versus American informality. American was thought to be a classless version of English, and there were those in Edwardian society who found that idea difficult to tolerate. But the First World War would test and change most of that. Edwardian English, like its Victorian parent, loved pageantry, pomp, and a society where every word knew its place. The trenches of the First World War detonated much of that. The First World War gave us new figures of speech as well as a vision of equality here in the trenches. Before the war, if you were in trouble or under pressure, you might have said you'd been thrown like a horse rider into a wasteland or a swamp, perhaps under a shower of criticism words drawn from peaceful country life. 
After 1918, you'd probably say you were being bombarded uh, under a barrage, shell-shocked, or in no man's land. The First World War gave British English firepower and front line, gas mask and camouflage, bonk for to shell with artillery, and dud for defective round. The balloon goes up was the signal for the artillery to open fire at zero hour. Over the top comes from the terrifying moment of climbing out of the trench. The biblical phrase, at the 11th hour, gained a new meaning from the time the final ceasefire was declared on Armistice Day. All terms from the very end of World War I. When the armistice finally came, more than the First World War was over, it underlined what was already a trend, the shift of power in many areas, including language, to America. While Europe had been burning, the USA had experienced massive industrial expansion. The factories of the northern states needed new workers, and the poor of the south, many of the descendants of former slaves, saw the opportunity they offered and moved in. The migrants, overwhelmingly black, came along tracks like these and railroads like these. They came to the cities of the north, cities like Chicago, pounding with growth then and pounding with growth now. And they changed America. They also changed the English language. In the 19th century, almost all Afro-Americans had lived in the south. By the end of the century, 95% were up in the north. And they injected a new energy into the language. They brought African speech, African rhythm, new vocabulary. We're gonna boogie, we're gonna boogie, we're gonna boogie, we're gonna get in the groove, we're gonna do these boogie blues. What brought black and white together and put black speech into mainstream American was music, first jazz, then blues. New words and expressions started to accompany the soundtrack of what America is perhaps best known for, popular culture. Today, the language would be unimaginable without its colonization by words and expressions of black and African origin. The very words jazz and blues arrive from Afro-American speech at the beginning of the century. The African word hippicat, meaning attuned to the environment or with his eyes open, gave us hepcat and later hip and cat. Later still, of course, its meaning grew to include the idea of hippie. White American embraced black American speech when people started to dance the hoochie-coochie and then the cakewalk, the shimmy, jive and boogie woogie. And perhaps it was the sex in black music that seduced white America. Jazz itself may originally have been a word meaning to have sex. Later on, rock and roll certainly was. Jelly roll, cherry pie and custard pie were all words for the female organ. Shack up, in the sense of living together, comes from black speech at this time too. Black American expressions are now so mainstream that it's forgotten almost all Americans and very many British, including almost all youth, now speak some sort of black. Young people want to be cool or bad, which was first recorded as meaning good in America in 1928. Others might want to be groovy or mellow, which came from melody in jazz circles in the early 40s. Square is out, but it may come back. Gonna get in the groove, gonna do these boogie blues. Boogie.